Welcome to this new podcast series brought to you by the Electrical Safety Network. I'm Dave Austin, and I'll be hosting the programs along with Gary Gundry, technical author and trainer who brings insight from the contracting world and specialist knowledge from BS7671, the regs, and on-site guidance. In this one, we stick our grubby fingers into the world of surge protection. Now, when SPDs are mentioned, the first name that comes to my mind is Robin Earl. Today, however, not content with one, we have two guests, as Robin is joined by Jason Hallam, both from the top manufacturer, Dane. Robin has over 20 years of experience in the field of surge protection. He served an apprenticeship at the family electrical engineering business in East Sussex, then worked for Phoenix Contact and ABB Sewell before moving to Dane. He was trained back in 1999 by Dr. Peter Haas, Dane MD and the godfather of the 10350 waveform. More of that in a moment. Robin is now marketing manager for Dane and sits on a couple of committees for the wiring regulations, BS7671 for search protection and foundation earthing, JPEL64 panel D. Jason Hallam started his career as an apprentice panel wireman and worked through various ranks, engineer to sales right through to company director. He joined Dane in 2018 as specification business manager, Midlands Central and South. Aside from his specialization in lightning and surge protection, he's a runner, a CAA registered drone operator, radio ham, and Spanish speaker. So many things to ask, so little time. Here's a taster of what you'll hear. And the regs very clearly says in 534.4.1.2, any cable that crosses a zonal interface must have an SPD. It doesn't take a lot to actually just take out that TV over time. So you can't fit an MCB in a tight one circuit because it will fail. Robin, welcome and good to see you again. I have to start right at the top with that bit of your biog to say, what is the 10350? It's a wave shape. It's the wave that we describe light in a, in a waveform, basically. So that the 10 part is 10 microseconds. That's the rise time. Uh, to get to the peak value, uh, is about 50% of peak value, and it's then a further 350 microseconds to fall away to roughly 3%. So actually, it's quite long in wave-shaped terms, whereas the surge one is just 8 slash 20. So in, in terms of SPDs, why do we use it? It's the difference between a lightning wave shape and a surge wave shape. Okay, and that plays its part when it comes to designing the devices to handle it. A absolutely. So under the IEC stroke BSEN 62305 requirements and 61643, the product standard, we have both wave shapes to tell us what's type 1 and type 2 SPDs. Um, it, it, it's, it's been the way since, oh, blimey, about 30 years, I would think now. Yes. Fascinating. Thank you very much for that, Jason. So absorbing all that, what's an SPD? An SPD is designed to, uh, let's say, extinguish a transient or an overvoltage, either of a surge event, a transient event, of either a switching event or of atmospheric origin. So it's there to quench and dump that energy safely back to Earth. It's interesting. We always think about them in the terms of lightning, but Gary, it's, it's actually man-made surges very often that cause more of a problem. It's lightning is one aspect, but what they can be created is internally from switching of motors, heavy starting currents, you know, lift motors and the a particularly bad switching environment. It's not the loading, it's the arcing of it and, or the breaking of the contacts of some of this stuff. A absolutely. And I'd, I'd say we get a lot of phone calls with regard to LED lighting, where, to be honest, people are installing this. It's obviously fantastic. It's very green. It's very eco but it's not lasting the 80,000 hours that is being expected because I've been to offices where they've converted from fluorescent to LED modular lighting and they're failing very frequently. And one place I went to, the answer was quite clear because opposite the office across the corridor is one of the world's oldest lift shafts. So you, you just go. hit the button, summon the lift, you actually see the lights blink with fluorescence. They're bomb-proof. They were lasting years, they shrugged it off. But with the LED drivers these same surges are damaging uh, the drivers and just degrading them over time and they just fail. So how is the lift uh, creating that surge current into the lights then, Robin? Uh, it's just imposing this transient from when the motors start up. So there's that surge of current and that imposes this onto other circuits and it's just too much. As I say, with the fluorescence, they just shrugged it off. You know, they're just um, so much more bomb-proof. 
So it's the resilience, to put it that way, or the withstand voltage, which is in section 443, that's dropped. And then these transients are just going around sort of damaging these little PCB components. And that's not described uh, really when you make the conversion, though I have heard certain companies are insisting that the LEDs are now protected with some form of transient overvoltage protection. Mm, good idea. Uh, Jason, I've, when I'm touring around talking with audiences, one of the most often confused questions are the three types we talk about. Can you summarise the types of SPD? Yeah, there's predominantly three types of SPD. Uh, your type one is what is the type of SPD that deals with lightning energy. So that's normally, or it's also known as equipotential bonding. So if a building has a lightning protection system, you would have a type one at the origin. And then for coordination purposes, downstream of that SPD, you would then put a type two SPD. And then where you have terminal end sensitive equipment, like fire alarm panels, for example, disable refuge call points uh, or even in a hospital very sensitive equipment server server room server racks you would have a type three so give you a complete coordinated protection bearing in mind that all coordinated spds must be of the same manufacturer to yeah, guarantee this, that this coordination thing is what we get asked a lot isn't it yeah we were only talking about it this morning we? i was just going to ask this question is from a contractor's point of view is if a tight one is at the front end, what, why can't I just rely on this? And, you know, <laughs> just one device. Um, that would be, there, there are several clauses in the regs which would frustrate that. Um, firstly, uh, 10 meter gets a lot of people. If we imagine any SPD at the origin, it's only effective for 10 meters of cable distance. But if, if I say have an origin and 100 meters away, I have, say, a server rack. Using the uh, methodology, I know that when I put 230 volts at the start, I don't get 240 volts at the end. I have a volt drop per meter. But with a spike or a, a transient imposed on the AC waveform, it actually increases with distance. So when I have an SPD at the origin, it does its job beautifully. Over that 20, 30 or whatever meters, I will need another one anyway to slap it down again because it's increased. And the regs say that no part of the installation can see a voltage greater than the most sensitive part. Otherwise, of course, it goes bang. So that server rack is probably rated at one and a half kV. Uh, the SPD will, as I say, do it so brilliantly. But if after 10 metres it's doubled, I need to slap it down again. So it's like an attenuation. It's rippling and it's doubling up mm, all the way. So absolutely. basically, so this but, type but, one, then you've got a type two a bit further on. So different sizes, different costs. Mm. And obviously, if, if the, the type one was got to be bigger... You wouldn't be putting that onto a fire alarm panel, would you? So, I, and, you, and you guys were saying that one of the most often asked questions is why are there so many? Why do I need so mm. many? And is that the reason why you do? Absolutely. Yeah, to maintain coordination. You know, it's all right having one at the origin, a type one, for example, but if you're not having a type three or even a type two at a sensitive equipment end, it's pointless. And, and actually, is it pointless? I mean, it really is ineffective if you don't have the full set. It is, yes. Uh, I mean, there are other reasons as well. And uh, then, then it starts to get more complicated, and that's in section 534. Very early on, you have this like circular diagram, the lightning protection zone concept. So as you sort of look at the origin, you have a cable coming in, you put your SPD there. But then you may have cables going out to sub-buildings or plant on the roof, and they are sort of, quote, holes in the Faraday cage. So they would need SPDs to deal with the threat from the roof line, I may have a, a, an office where there's a security guard or a cabin in the car park. I may have security light and et cetera. That's a cable coming from the outside in, and that needs to be addressed. And then when I look further in the installation, um, following the lightning protection zone concept, um, every distribution board or control panel is an LPZ2, a screened object, in the building, which is LPZ1, and LPZ0 is outside. And the regs very clearly says in 534.4.1.2, any cable that crosses a zonal interface must have an SPD. So if you think about all those zonal crossing points, the numbers of SPDs, he said with a big smile on his face, goes up dramatically. <laughs> so that's brilliant. Every cloud has a silver lining, Robin. Absolutely. Well, we we yes. both had the benefit of, of visiting the factory in Germany, and I was mm. it was breathtaking, the number of SPDs in your racks. Absolutely. It's just littered with them everywhere. Yeah. Uh, is that actually a model of how it should be? Yes, it is. It, it's absolutely to the letter. It's to the standard, exactly. And... Sadly, it's quite a rare sort of installation. You know, there's so many. 
Uh, what really winds me up is when I look on LinkedIn and someone's showing, say, um, uh, like a commercial structure and they show all the panels that they've wired up and I can't see a single SPD apart from the one at the origin. You think, And, and, and you want to comment, but you just know you're going to you get a load of nonsense <laughs> yeah, back. Been, been, so, <laughs> so, Jason, you, you fight this battle every day, I guess, specifying installations. How do you overcome it? How do you explain it? Um, well, following the letter of BSM 671 is normally the one, you know, the trump card we use, but uh, it does become a bit of an issue sometimes with certain projects I'm working on where because the structure has lining protection, it's a must, thou must, you have a type yes. one at the origin. But when it comes to sensitive equipment further downstream, then they start looking at the, the you know, the cost, the risk, the element. Do I need them all on these? We're prepared to sacrifice that. That's This is where it gets very awkward at times. And, of course, SPDs are not a fit for life, are they? I mean, they will wear out because as they, as they absorb uh, energy... Uh, they they will. I think, I think the most important thing to stress is they're not a one-hit wonder. It's not like a fuse. Under the product standard um, 61643, they have to take, I think it's their nominal value, say it's a 25KA rated vice, they have to take that 15 times. And in this country, that's not going to happen. We're not the lightning capital of the country, or the universe even, really. You know, we have a very low, what they call NG value or ground flash density value. So I've had calls... Uh, one of them was from a, an institution in London, and it had failed. They phoned me up, what's the spare part? So I said, what's the part number you got? I had to look it up. It was 30 years old. You know, so it's, it's you know, these are not things that are going to fail often, but if they are, either relocate or it needs investigation. Cause so, Gary, the, the regs have fiddled with SPDs for, well, since 2008, since, since the 17th edition when they first started to be talked about. And we've still not really got good answers, have we? They've got better. I mean, it started off with just an introduction to sort of let people know about it. Then obviously when the 18th came out, well, there's an amendment in between that for Amendment 3. They just got a little bit more more pages. And it's grown considerably with the number of pages. So we're, we're more familiar. So we've got the detail for the protection for safety in, in 443. So it's mm -hmm. about scoping what you need to do, sort of to do to do for the risk assessment as well. Yes. And then in Part 5, you've got where to fit it, how to install it, and cable lengths and things like that. So it's grown because people needed more information. You just can't say thou shalt specify without giving the detail. So that's that's where we are at the moment. That's been another fear factor. I know a lot of uh, Sparks are slightly nervous about the cable length requirements because they're pretty stringent, aren't they? Oh, uh, y yes. I mean, it, this, this is for the installation. Yes. Yes. The, the regs do give you a little bit of wriggle room, but it's not a lot. Um, the, Half a metre? Yes. And if you think about some large panels, if you're putting it in an enclosure outside of it, because um, you don't want to take up too much within the panel itself, it's a challenge. But the regulations do give you some get-out-of-jail cards, and one is something called an intermediate earth terminal. So once you've made the connections from your phase bars or the overcurrent protective device to the SPD, that could be about half a metre, but the connection to Earth is like to the chassis. It doesn't need to be more than, say, 100 mil long because everything you're fitting is in a metal box and the metal box is all cross-bonded. So there are ways of fitting them easily within half a metre. Never, ever take it more than a metre to your main Earth terminal. If you're in a metal consumer unit, just take it to the box. You have then instant current division on all those CPCs going in all different directions, and that's perfect. So, you know, it, it, if, so long as you keep it in these very stringent um, 500 mil uh, framework, then you'll, you'll be absolutely fine. If you don't, the volt drop across that circuit is too high, and that forces you to have even more SPDs. I'm just going to add there that if you factor in that distance and you sort of said, I think more attenuation of cables, the longer it was, the better it would be. But I used to suggest to people that if it was five metres away, if you've got circuits connected going out and you had a server four metres away, that would be affected because it wouldn't know just to go down to the path to the SPD, would it? It would spread out. It would sort of like emanate into the installation. So if you had sensitive equipment within that five metres, that would be at risk, wouldn't it? It, it, it would. You, you've got to keep these connection cables as short as possible. It's absolutely vital. It, it really is. And the, and the other thing we get calls on a lot is what is the value of the fuse? In every manufacturer's instructions may vary a bit, 
But the idea is to make sure, so it's most important with a Type 1. A Type 1 device is a minimum of 12,500 amps. So that circuit will see going down at 12,500 kA. So you can't protect it with an MCB because <laughs> what's the rupture capacity of the MCB? Six or six, ten kA, six, typically. Yes. So that, and I've seen so many pictures, and I'm sure you have too, yes. of circuit breakers which have gone bang and exploded. So you can't fit an MCB in a tight one circuit because it will fail. So can I rely on the cutout views? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Potentially. And the reason we say that is our device, it, let, let's take the Type 1 again, that's rated at, say, 160 amps. So the, the energy in that 160 amps will be uh, dealt with by the SPD. We, we have um, a test. It sounds archaic, but when we do the test, we actually drape a bit of muslin cloth over the SPD, force these fault currents, and the point at which the muslin cloth starts to get a bit hot and scorched... <laughs> Is right. the tipping point for the fusing. It's back to your moist finger on a <laughs> yeah, fuse. Touching touch the fuse from the fourth edition. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Fourth edition, they mentioned that if, it, if a fuse sizzled when it was touched with a moist finger, it was possibly too low value. <laughs> well, no, if it hits with moist. With that. Yeah. <laughs> Sam Simmel. Uh, yep. Jason, we're doing a lot of talk at the moment about EV installation, and there is a bit of a debate about whether or not that needs to be protected with a surge protective device. What, what do you recommend? Always. Or we always well, recommend. of course, you're from Paint. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, not being biased here. No, uh, we look at um, the value. I mean, a lot of EV cars now, hybrids, plug-in hybrids, uh, full electric cars such as Teslas are very, and all for very, thirty thousand pounds. Yeah, well, um, yeah. Presumably, we're not again. We're not talking about the car just exploding in a in a massive ball of flame. We're talking about degradation of the charger. Correct. With that's the sort of thing we're talking yeah, about. We yeah, we get we get that a lot. Um, this is the way we try and sort of let's let's not say the word sell, but it's the degradation. I'm all right. I'm all right at the minute. I've had no problems for two years, but if you've had transients over that two year period that you don't know about, the odd power cut, the odd switch on, the odd lightning storm, you know the indirect transient that comes on the network, it's that degradation of the electronic equipment. It's that moment you turn something on that's been working for years and it suddenly doesn't work yeah, and you don't yeah. know why. We, it... we Talking of the degradation element as well, a lot of electronic equipment, say within our homes, are all made by one manufacturer at one voltage. It's only the switch mode power supply that is changed to allow the universal selling of TVs, for example. So if you look at the back of a TV nowadays, you'll see the nominal voltage of the input is at 220. That's to make us all, it's easier to do that because we fall within that harmonised, you know, this this uh, little tolerance level. Yeah, so, but if you look at, say, a very expensive TV, using an example, and you do get a transient, it doesn't take a lot to actually just take out that TV over time. The degradation, the heat of the seat, it's running at its limit now at 240. That little tip over. Yeah, the, the voltage range is like something like 100 volts to 240. So it Correct. It, yeah, so we, we, we're way over specking this. And I was going to say that in, in the event of a fault, it could damage the equipment and actually just take it out. So it just fails to work. Like you said, just switch it on. So in the event, so it's not actually caught fire. It's just, just given up. Look safely, at, safely, we, of course. We've talked about the, the regs being a bit fiddly on this subject, but... It's covered in a couple of areas. So where would you recommend starting, Jason? If you're if you're trying to specify, where would you go in the regs to start looking up what needs to be done with the SPD? Right. We've got uh, two sections in BSM 6M1, uh, section 443 and section 534. Now, what the first thing you need to establish is, is that particular structure or that building you're working on, does it have a lightning protection system? If it has a lightning protection system, then forget section 443 and go straight to section 534. If the building doesn't have a lightning protection system or that particular structure, then you can do the risk assessment in section 443 to establish whether you need um, surge protection or to not. Go to 543. Um, 443 uh, refers to transient over voltages due to uh, atmospheric origin and 534 um, devices for protection against over voltage. So it's established the need and then yeah. go and find out yeah. what you do with it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. lightning protection system go straight to 534. Oh. I think it's worth elaborating that the risk assessment is only for the dwelling. Correct, yeah. So if you've got a um, lightning protection system, 62305 trumps 7671, you fit the SPDs. Then in section 443.4, you've got those categories, 
uh, where you've got the consequences like uh, risk to human life, or public life, service, yeah, yeah. Um, commercial activity, all of that. So if you tick the box there, that is for structures that don't have lightning protection, so they're smaller in scale. They still have an SPD anyway. There's no negotiation. And then what's left is really like the dwelling or very small structures, and that's when you do the risk assessment. So that's, that's the way to do it. Uh, let's say there's a bungalow, which is now a doctor's surgery. Um, there might not be lightning protection, but it's pretty much a vowel shout because of the threat to human life. But if you took all the medical stuff out of the bungalow, now it's just dwelling, now you do the risk assessment. So it's about kind of what are the consequences of not doing it? And if it's bad, just fit the SPD. And I've always known, you've always said, Robert, I'm sure you would say, Jason, you're welcome to invite an inspection and some advice. You'll always oh, go absolutely. and do a survey. Yes, and, uh, yes, yes. We, we, we do all this the all the time. Yeah. yeah, you know, we work from drawings or we go to site um, to handhold really uh, uh, the contract or whoever around it. And to be honest, after that, they'll have the knowledge to do the next one on, on their own. We want to get them to the point where they're uh, independent and can carry on, basically. Yeah. It's education. Well, that's been brilliant. I've, I've learned more, as I always do when I'm in the roof, uh, Mr. Earl, of course, uh, always be, and Jason, but uh, Mr. Earl is, is a fount of knowledge he for is, me yeah. at, at all times. <laughs> uh, thank you, guys. I think we're going to stop it there because we could keep going on SPDs forever because mm. it's a big old topic, but I think we've covered some very good bits. So, chaps, thank you for coming in. All the rest. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, thanks to Robin and Jason from Dane for not just a surge of info, but a positive torrent. And, of course, Gary Gundry for his thoughts. So are you now fully enclosed in a Faraday cage of knowledge or are there still some holes? Well, whatever, I hope you found this podcast entertaining and informative. Check out other podcasts in our series from the Electoral Safety Network. I'm Dave Austin. Thank you for listening. <laughs>